Today, for the series Women as Pioneers of Change in the World of Museums, Museo City will meet Mary Jane Jacob, an American curator, writer, and professor from Chicago, whose pioneering work in public and socially engaged art has won so many distinctions worldwide, they're impossible to count. Her work is of vital importance when discussing museums and museum policies for the innovative forms of art making she has introduced outside the museum context by engaging directly with the public, creating new and different relationships with audiences. At the beginning of her career in the 1970s at the Detroit Institute of Arts, she courageously championed artists beyond the mainstream, particularly those working outside the recognized capital of contemporary art of the time, New York, supporting the work of women and those employing experimental or non-traditional art media. Digging below the surface of conventionally accepted forms of culture, she has given voice to artists and poets from counterculture movements while at the same time um, introducing yet unknown artists from Europe, such as Cornelis and Mario Merz from Italy, Magdalena Abakanovic from Poland, Francis Christian Woltanski, and Switzerland's Dieter Roth. After having worked as chief curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and in Los Angeles, she proceeded literally to shift her workplace to the streets. Since 1990, she has worked as an independent curator, organizing community uh, groundbreaking programs, especially two landmark site-specific and community-based exhibitions. Places with a past, which catalyzed two decades of community engagement in, Ch in Charleston, South Carolina, bringing to the fore a completely new history, which acknowledged the contribution of many communities, including Black Americans. Culture in Action uh, in Chicago in 1993, which is also an innovative process of public dialogue, involvement in uh, many uh, multi-neighborhoods and a community storefront. Um, in her role as Professor and Executive Director of Exhibitions and Exhibition Studies at the School of Art His Institute of Chicago, she has introduced a new approach to curating based on the teachings of the American pragmatist John Dewey and the principles of learning by doing. Mary Jane, welcome to Museo City. Um, I'd like to ask you my first question, which is, as a curator of contemporary art and in your early years as chief curator in two major museums, your first concern has always been for the audience, an audience of non-specialists, the public, let's say, in general. How has this concern influenced the choices you have made in your career? Well, I have to say that I am an audience and I was an audience as a child. And that's something I brought with me all the way through. Um, it wasn't because I lived in a house of art or even in what we would call an art and cultured atmosphere. But uh, luckily I grew up on the edges of New York City. So I, I had a lot of access, but um, I can say also that I had no idea that this place where I was visiting on weekends as a young teenager and, and so forth, um, that, uh, that my playground of the Museum of Modern Art was so famous, that New York more so was revered by the world as, at that time, the only place for art. Working in museums, I. I brought that consciousness to there because um, in another way, uh, while I gravitated to this idea that um, I wanted to do art, but I didn't necessarily want to be an artist. And so let's do museums. Um, of course, you know, unlike what 
students today have to do. I didn't even know the word curator. I didn't know what I meant. And, um, and at the same time, there was that possibility to get inside that I feel is um, closed up for others. Um, but, uh, but I have to say what really kind of, um, if you will, personally, philosophically, and to a degree, professionally um, theorized what I was doing happened at the outset as a graduate student before I entered one of those museums that you mentioned uh, as an intern. And that is that I was given the opportunity to take on an extra internship um, before I entered what was would then be my official internship at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And that was in a program called the Michigan Art Training, six car train converted into galleries that traveled around the country, bringing art to tiny communities. And um, it, it was quite an exciting thing. And I went ahead and put together the exhibition that was in the contemporary car. What was so amazing about that moment is that I understood what people thought people, this non-specialist, and again, of course, we're generalizing, but what people outside the world of art and outside New York thought about art. And it was this super tension of fear and love, of desire and, uh, and hostility. And it was based on this situation of not knowing and people being treated by us as a deficient audience. That if you don't know art history, if you haven't brought, been brought up in this culture, you don't know how to experience, you are, sorry, stupid and, um, and uncultured, mm -hmm. and that there is no way for you to enter this without this kind of quasi-professional group. And that was not at all what the art train was about, but I, I went into a role of mediating that. And, and I also already at that point had an experience with the audience of people that I was training, for instance, as docents. And they were hostile to the work. And yet over, but they had decided to do this, to volunteer to do this. So what, what was that about? And and over the experience of just a very short days, they were transformed as they came at ease with this. And, um, and that they took on what Dewey talks about, which we will talk about later, um, that once you do have this experience with art, you want to share it. So that it is essentially a communal experience. So um, I, I then, did go to the museum and even though the art train had offered me a full-time job and the curator I was to apprentice with said, no, it's now time she comes to a real museum and works with real art. And I thought, you are dead wrong, <laughs> but I will do it. And then I will have those chops and then we see what happens. So, so this kind of museums and inside and outside and public is, has been there and I'm, I'm grateful for that unusual experience. Yes, but at the same time, the museum itself seems to be limiting in some way because of the extreme uh, prestige and the um, in, impossibility of uh, people being treated for what they are. So um, when you started working outside the museum, for example, in a context like Places with a Past in uh, Charleston, that was, it has become a milestone in history. Um, so why is that project in Charleston, for example, still so relevant today? Um, well, on the one hand, after having done numerous museum shows in, Detroit and Chicago and Los Angeles, the museums and places in which I worked. Um, this was a kind of 
uh, throwback, if you will, to that history like the art train of art for the people, going to the people. But, um, but it really proved to be more than that. And, um, and while, you know, in some ways it carried on curatorial practices of like Jan Hoot's 1986 Chambre d'Ami, where artists made things in people's homes, or, um, or Kasper Koenig's 87 sculpture project in Munster, where art is outside and in the public and had some political edges. Um, this place was uh, a place that was new to me, uh, very welcoming to me, but, um, but also completely complex. And, and in talking to people on the street with artists as we were, as I was selecting artists and we were roaming to say, oh, where could we make a site-specific work that would, yes, bring art to the people and be the, the first free event, the Spoleto Festival USA had ever done for the people of Charleston and for its other audiences. Um, what were we encountering in these conversations? And, and I met people who were so committed to their place, not only in a kind of jingoistic way, like, yeah, Charleston is great and you should come visit it and it's a beautiful city, but, mm -hmm. but having, because we were working uh, very much with choosing to work with the African-American culture there, I, I encountered people who were, I don't mean to sound silly, but who were 350 year old people. I'd never met people who so embodied their culture and, and their struggles and yet were invincible and proceeded on. Um, you know, when we say, how is it relevant today? Yes, you know, it's a way of looking at some projects that could be political in their representation, a way of using unusual indoor and outdoor sites to make art. But I think what's really relevant, and I'm sorry to say it continues to be relevant, is because it has, to put it in today's terms, everything to do with Black Lives Matter. You know, exactly. it's... And, and, and I would politely correct you, Anna, that uh, it wasn't revealing a new history. It was revealing a very old history, the actual history, the erased history. And, um, and, and communicate. It was, new to, it was new to the art audience, let's say, <laughs> in yes. that way. Yes, and because, you know, unlike Sculpture Project, which had preceded it by four years, um, that you you might, for instance, there have seen Rebecca Horn's project, which still exists, which dealt with a Nazi prison. Um, but you could also see other works which were conceptual or minimalist or did other things. And every one of these projects dealt with this uh, tense and fraught history. And um, And I was kind of stunned that it had been so erased or suppressed, let's say suppressed, um, that it really did open up and change practices of some institutions there and has in part enabled the creation of an international African-American museum, which will open in a few years. So, um, so I think, you know, it, it, played, uh, it played into some embodied understanding of what we're now more openly calling systemic racism. Um, did it change the world? No, but it changed practices there and it also influenced uh, other museological practices because um, it just made so evident and stunningly with the cooperation of Charlestonians um, what we could visualize that art could do to help us see. Yeah. Well, oh, it's obviously unveiling um, the conventions of the art world um, by revealing something which is part of reality, I should say. Um, how, would you, uh, how would you define culture in action? Culture in action is another art exhibition which you uh, did in Chicago in 1993, which follows on from Places with the Past. How is it different? Um, how was, what was important? The public, the dialogue, which I think is perhaps something completely new 
for um, the idea of an exhibition in the art world, the art as, art as process. How, how did Culture in Action um, take a step further from places with, with the past? Um, I will say that in part, places with the past grew itself organically, um, not with the mandate or the theory at the outset of we're going to remedy or reveal history, um, but it became evident by listening, using listening. And, and what catapulted Culture in Action, which was already a discussion while I was doing Places of the Past, but then jumped on that, as you say, immediately thereafter, um, is that when I was there with, let's say, uh, celebrated art personalities who were, um, you know, immediately attracted to this exhibition, and we were standing at one project, uh, a house called House of the Future by David Hammonds, part of a two-part project that he did on a couple of adjoining street corners. And, and somebody remarked about how great it was to work with the public. And I thought, you know, we, we did this whole show from invitation to finish in 15 months. That was fast. Um, that David Hammonds did spend a lot of time, but, you know, it was a vexing process for him too, because people were uh, very vocal and, uh, and challenging sometimes, not exactly as, as his experience had been um, working before and, and was a rather unique project in his whole career. But I thought, yes, working with the public, but to be honest, we, we listened to them. We, we tried to perceive, but we didn't really do that. So what if you really did that? And what if you did that and you didn't have this thing pushing at your back of, we have to open, we have to have something to photograph, we have an exhibition, we have this, Thing that we have to present. What if that stayed open as to what that would be and when that would be? And maybe it would have more of a sense of continuity like life than that moment of exhibition. And then what is the corollary to that, which is then it's down and it goes away, right? Because um, that wasn't that wasn't the intent, but that, you know, in all purposes is what that looked like was happening in Charleston, of course. Uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, it, it happened again uh, more times later. But with culture and action, I mean, it was in Chicago where I had lived then for a couple of, well, I had lived for a um, little over a decade uh, at that point. And, um, and working with less artists, working with eight instead of almost uh, 25 or 30, and, um, and really grounding it in questions of how, what, is, what does art mean and to the public and how can we make public art, so this is a different genre than museum exhibitions, but how can we make public art as much about the public as it is about art? So coming back to that kind of art train alienation of audience um, where they feel it's not for them. And so, you know, this fact that the work could exist over time, that it could bubble up and down, that it could be private within a collaborating community, and that every artist would collaborate in some way with others. Um, and that at other times you would, uh, there might be some synchronicity and you could see multiple things at once, um, was very befuddling to critics and who really lashed out like, well, how are we gonna see this? Cause we're coming and then you can't, there's nothing to see. <laughs> well, there's a whole city of Chicago to see and we're gonna take you around eight neighborhoods and you know, it's gonna be very different. But uh, you know, that was, that, was, that was part of their problem. But to me, it was still an exhibition because we were manifesting, we were manifesting on a number of levels. We were manifesting the city and its issues itself, you know, the, because the, the aim was how can we put together the public social issues with the artists' aesthetic issues, which include social interests, aesthetic issues, and how can they meet and how can they work together? Therefore, everybody has a stake in this. Everybody cares about what's happening. And um, and will 
hopefully sustain that process or those that will will emerge. Um, so, but to me, it was this exhibition because we were we were giving it that open play space of imagination that an exhibition does because it's not a real thing. Um, we were giving it a frame. Um, we did at one point decide that everybody wanted to celebrate what they were doing. So we created a moment in the summer of 93 where in fact those art critics could come and see something but they couldn't see the whole project because there was something else that happened in january and something else that happened the year before and something else that would happen later that we never knew one of the projects still goes on now over 20 years later um and is an organized youth organization called street level video uh youth media so um yeah and and we were exhibiting you know what what it is it to make art uh let's look at who is the public for this um and what are those processes so uh it was it was a very exciting exhausting time some of those artists again like i mentioned with david hammonds never did that work again because it's taxing <laughs> but um did it did it change their lives Yes, you can you can read that from Mark Dion and others. Um, yeah. So I would say this uh, groundbreaking work, which has um, changed the whole idea of what art making is, uh, both for artists but also for the public, which you had um, you you managed to touch and you were that that were part of your work. So. This brings us um, very close to the work of the American philosopher, pedagogist, and uh, pragmatist John Dewey, which uh, who you have often quoted. You have dedicated a book to him uh, and his idea of art as experience, a book which he wrote in uh, 1934, so, um, so many years ago, but which is still with us, which um, neuroscientists uh, could quote today as um, an anticipatory idea of, um, of what art is. Um, how, does, how has this concept of art, which obviously directly involves the viewer, um, how has that uh, influenced not only your work as curator, but also your work as, as teacher, as lecturer, um, in, which is what you are doing now? Well, Dewey valued the experience we have in life, and he felt that fundamentally an artwork, the way that an artist works, comes from their experiences in life and they manifest it in a work of art. That art is meaningless if it doesn't connect to who we are and, and play a role in who we can become. And that, you know, we, we talk about art and life all the time in the modern era of the 20th century. You know, whether we're talking about Impressionism, we're talking about Dada, you know, you name it. And, um, but it's not just an artism. It's not just an art mechanism. It is essential and connected. And, and I really felt I had that gift as my own naive experience and that people don't have to be shut out because of identity and knowledge includes identity. Um, and, and that also, as I mentioned, that this, this idea of sharing this experience is important. But for Dewey, the idea was to, to not only take that information or that experience into our lives, but for it to change us. And of course, he meant change us for the better and as also a philosopher of American democracy, he meant that we were going to take on the values of democracy and live them. That to him, democracy itself was a creative practice, constantly in transformation, continuously, never ending. We're always making it. We're making it right now, right now, this minute, please, in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. And, um, and that 
this is part, art helps us kind of work through this process. And when he says experience, he doesn't just mean, I saw this show. He means that we had a full experience, not a big experience, but an experience that went a full course, that we processed it, that it, it challenged us, that it came through, that it was like what those docents struggled with on the art train, that they processed it and they came out the other end and because it became integrated into them, not because they learned some lines that I gave them, that they started to appreciate, an old fashioned word, appreciate and, and believe in that art. And for me, um, as someone who had come from museums and chosen to work in another way, uh, what also was exciting about coming to Dewey later in life, only in this, you know, in the last, 15 years seriously, or 10 years even, um, it, because I, I don't work from philosophy, I work from artists, uh, is that for me, it, he felt that this experience we get in a certain way through art. It doesn't only happen through art, and it certainly doesn't only happen through works of art. It happens through aesthetic, full, consummated, integrated experiences we have in the world when we feel something uh, that matters to us, but that, that it can happen with works of art, that works of art have a very special quality because they are the essence of experience and afford experience for us. And so he felt that art and artists could make a difference. And for me, as a, um, as I can say in a way, fleeing the museum world, that it reaffirmed my faith in art that I was very much losing at the time when I left museums. And, and that happened through my own practice, but then Dewey helped explain it to me later about why that was working that way. So, um, so yes, it, it, it helped to mend, I have to even say, that wound between myself and museums and the codifying aspect of that. I, I have to throw in one other project, Anna, which is at the same time around the early 2000s, when I was uh, discovering Dewey, starting to work at the School of the Art Institute, I was also undertook with um, 50 other colleagues, a four-year research project. And it was of a range of museum individuals who were, uh, I'll put it in my own words, feel it had some sense of disenfranchisement or unease about how museums operated. And, and the research project was looking at the relationship of the mind and meditation, the mind in, so the Buddhist practitioner, the mind in creation, the artist, and the mind in recreation, the viewer that the viewer has in some way shares what the artist has and you know and what this does and it was it was an exciting big research project but um but at that time in this struggle about museums and uh and this possibility at the school came which to me was like no institution i'm an independent curator i've been working on the street i can't I can't go into an institution. And, and a Buddhist priest who was our advisor was very uh, helpful at that time. And she said, she said, you know, the museum is a place of having. They have a collection, they have a history, they have a certain way that they do things and they're safeguarding their place of having. But a school is a place of becoming. It has not the value that a museum has. You can't put a price tag on it. We don't know if these students are gonna be great artists. We don't know if there's gonna be great works of art. If this is our driving force, we have no way to evaluate this. But what it is as a place of becoming is always in flux. Like democracy is always in flux, like art is always in flux, like our life is always in flux. And if we didn't understand that, we all learned that a few months ago. And most of all, this place of becoming is a generative place. So there's always something 
coming alive. And, um, and so I jumped into that pot of the school. Okay. Um, one last question for you, Mary Jane, which is um, starting from the uh, whole idea of this series of encounters with uh, women in museums and women's role and women's potential in museums. Because I think that your experience um, with Dewey, but also with art as experience um, so close to life and the gender aspect of art that you talk about is very close to um, a woman's way of looking at the world. The whole idea of caring, for example, which is at the root of the word curator. Uh, so the whole um, ethic and aesthetic of curating. How does this, how has that changed for you? And uh, what does it mean you would teach uh, in the, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago? How has your approach um, to education in the arts changed? And how is your role, how is your role as a woman without wanting to emphasize or overemphasize the idea of, uh, of, of being women because it's not, we're not talking about uh, um, uh, a, a gender issue really. We're talking about an, an approach, uh, something which has been historically and uh, uh, generally um, a part of, of a woman's way of dealing with things and also of, of uh, your approach to art. Well, happily over the last few decades, um, feminist art history and discourses around diversity have mixed things up and in doing that opened things up. Maybe not in all sectors, but, um, but the contemporary art world and particularly a contemporary art school, such as the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which has a robust group of historians and scholars and designers and artists and so forth, are very involved in the discourses of time. And students come for that reason. And it also is a place where they can be themselves and find out what that means. So, um, so I think that's that's part of what we're, we're talking about, that that climate has changed from, you know, early on when, when in museums I did uh, in the beginning, mostly shows of women because they were left out and I was taking on my own identity into moving them forward or recognizing them or, or finding in that way the forgotten, um, that, that it is a more embodied thing that we understand that if we are open, we all have multiple identities and roles and, and that we can embrace those. And while they change over time, they are part of who we are. Um, I mean, with my students, I begin, you know, before, um, before they're, you know, coming up with what's a hypothetical show to do. I don't do that at all, mind you. Um, you know, what we really grounded in is what do you care about? What do you care about? You know, more than what's your interest, what do you care about? And, you know, again here, the, the synchronicity of the Buddhism project and the school coming together was helpful because, because another lesson from that was to be able to distinguish between aims and goals. You know, if you're coming in, especially today in the, our world of COVID and you say, well, I want to do a show of X number of artists and they're going to be from these places in the world because they all are showing this kind of thing. Well, you might not be able to do that. And, and online might not be a very satisfying thing. But what's the reason why you want to do that show? What's at the core of that? what's the aim of that and what could be different ways that could happen not just being creatively uh engaged and thinking up something different but but where that aim could come even stronger into play 
and you would arrive at a goal of a project to implement that you hadn't imagined because you go deeper into what you care about. What is this aim? And, um, and so we talk about that and, and it's so basic. Um, you know, it's at the root of the curator's passion. Uh, it's, you know, behind the years of scholarship. But, um, but we kind of also can lose that path and, and something as simple, but also profound as what do you care about? Um, it amazes me that it's a revelation and a new thing and nobody asked them that. And, and then of course, you know, what we're talking about is then how do you nurture that process? How do you care for that process? How do you care for the artists? How do you care for the audience? Who else is involved in this? And so when we think about things like, do collaborators get paid? Do interns get paid? Do artists get paid? Some of the issues, you know, that have ethical and sometimes can have other sociological demographics connected to them, you know, then, then we understand that, that that's part of caring for the process and caring for those from whom we are um, receiving something and, and hope to give something in exchange. You know, one of the issues which comes up in the, in the, in the way that museums have at least in the past worked um, you know, where they would solicit a community, work with them, the community would feel they got mined and then dropped, for instance, because, mm -hmm. because in the end, it was about the presentation. I'm not saying that's the case now, or that's the case uh, with all projects, because there are many that are, are thoughtful and, and longstanding relationships now. But, you know, the, the ethics of how we work affects everything. And and if we are learning other ethical examples or we're learning other ways that somebody did something so we can think about how we can take that but do it differently, you know, those, those are not grounded. What the ha to me, what it has to be grounded is, is what do we care about and that care being greater than an interest and our process being one which is filled with caring um, to the point of exhaustion, filled with caring, <laughs> And, um, and understanding that that's what it takes. I mean, some students have worked with me on, on massive year long exhibitions we've done and they've said, you know, I, I never knew what it was like to be in an artist studio before. I never knew what went into making an exhibition. I never want to do it again, but wow, I have such respect for this, you know? And, and so of course they might do it again. But, you know, like build respect in that process between artists and curators, emerging curators and emerging artists uh, to understand what working together is about. Um, that's not necessarily breaking out of the art world, but that's also part of, you know, what we can do by sustaining dialogue and, um, and creating a caring atmosphere. And, um, and I think well, that's what we hope to see. Okay, well, thank you very much for your vision and your practice, Mary Jane, because I think it is, as you have um, explained it today, it is really a hope for the future and a, a hope and a, an indication of how we could um, go ahead and how um, to be uh, to be able to give priority to what we what we do it's a very simple yet profound way forward so thank you very much thank you thank you, all. And thank you museo city for continuing this process in challenging times thank you thank you mary jane goodbye yeah.